I hope I, I hope I've, you know, it's always the worry, right? You always want to, you know, make sure that you kind of pitched it right. So, um, but that's the good thing about leaving room for questions, you know? Like, yeah, and I normally we would have these presentations in person. And yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think is the most beneficial thing for the students is that there's time for networking afterwards. Uh, and so uh, we're going to miss this with the Zoom stuff. But uh, the good news is that it opens us up to a lot of people who maybe can't travel to, to Del Bell to, to come to a yeah. talk. Uh, so we have some speakers. Well, I've got one in London that will be speaking. Oh, that's there. cool. Uh, we're having to do that at noon, though. I didn't think I could keep him up until midnight. <laughs> <laughs> You're like my mother. Like. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So let's see. We've got already got 92 people in the room. Okay. Uh, and we'll give it a couple of more minutes here before. Let's see how quickly we can get that to zero. <laughs> <laughs> and let me check. I want to make sure that this is actually recording. It is recording, so we should be good. And it is 6 p.m. So for those people who have actually come in on time, uh, I think that I'll kind of get started here. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to the first One Health seminar for fall 2020. This marks five years of seminars each fall and spring semesters at Del Val. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 had kind of impacted us in the spring, and we ended up having to cancel of the tail end of our, our seminar series, but we're back. And we're back in Zoom, which hopefully uh, actually maybe allows some people to come that can't normally make it. So I wanna start out as I do with all of our seminars and kind of give you an introduction to One Health. Uh, One Health is a concept that really kind of sprang from uh, having concerns about environmental quality, uh, human health, and uh, conditions that may impact humans, and that linkage between animals and the environment and people. And this triad really works in all different directions, and it can work in a positive way or it can work in a negative way. Uh, we at Del Val are kind of exploring this as a transdisciplinary systems approach, and essentially looking at it not only from a local area, but all the way up to a global systems, and recognizing that there's inextricable links between us, the environment, and animals. And this can come in all kinds of different ways. And we are really approaching this from the standpoint that all of our majors at Del Val should recognize and embrace the One Health concept. That there are very few problems out there in the world that can be approached solely from one particular discipline. Uh, you talk about the environment, you've got to talk about economic impacts and social impacts. Uh, the environment has emotional impacts on us. So uh, we're hoping that all of our majors will embrace this and we're strongly encouraging our community to participate in these One Health seminars because we'd like them to embrace it as well. And our overall hope is that by uh, embracing this, our students are going to be much better prepared for entering the real world which is really a transdisciplinary space. And the way we approach this is through three basic things. One is education. Uh, all of my students in my classes get abused on a daily basis with One Health, uh, trying to talk about how uh, anything that we're talking for about in a concept standpoint links with a bunch of other disciplines as well. Research can be a opponent of this too. And, embracing the fact that others from other disciplines may be part of uh, working with you to deal with any particular problem. And then finally, there's outreach. And, and that's what the One Health seminars are all about, is open to everybody, trying to uh, get people to engage across a whole host of different topics. And if you've looked at the, the series for this semester, I think we've got a heck of a series available for you. Uh, and finally, if you want to know more about One Health at Del Val, you can go to www.delval.edu at One Health. And you'll find some of our past seminars there. Uh, we record our seminars, so this one will also be posted there eventually. 
And uh, that should lead us right into tonight's presenter. Let's see if you can share your screen again or whether I'm, nope. Yep, there you go. Well, it is my pleasure to uh, have our first speaker this semester, and that is Dr. Shelley Rankin from PennVet. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about herself. And I think uh, the topic is certainly one that's of interest to all of us. We've been bombarded with COVID-19 for a number of months now, but it's not just people that are involved. It's all to you, Dr. Rankin. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to my office, everyone. And um, I'm gonna tell you why I'm in my office in a moment. But um, first of all, I'm very thankful for the opportunity um, to talk to you all about black thorns and pussycats and some SARS-CoV-2. I have been following the uh, pandemic really from you know the very beginning. I've been watching many of these um, emerging viruses over the years. And there was, there was something about this one, like pretty early on, I think, in the microbiology community that we realized that um, it may be a little different. But let me tell you why I'm in my office. So I am the Chief of Clinical Microbiology and the Head of Diagnostic Services at uh, Penn Vets Ryan Hospital in Philadelphia. So the vet school, as you may or may not know, is based in Philadelphia, but we also have a campus um, at uh, New Bolton Centre in Kennett Square. And so what that means is we actually have two lab systems. So we have one in the hospital for companion animals in Philadelphia, and we have the other on the New Bolton Centre campus. And we basically split our work into two. Um, I get to do all of the companion animal diagnostics with my wonderful colleagues here at Penn Vet. And uh, New Bolton Centre um, really works very closely with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and all of the livestock producers in the state. Uh, so they basically get, you know, the chickens and the cows and the horses and we get the dogs and cats. Um, I was actually the microbiologist at New Bolton Centre from 2006 to 2013. Um, and then I jumped to the, to the lab in Philadelphia. Um, my one healthness is um, basically I came to the University of Pennsylvania in 1999. Um, I was working in the Scottish Salmonella Reference Laboratory. Um, that's where the accent's from. And I, I met a professor from Penn who was doing research in, uh, with the poultry industry. I was studying salmonella on the human side, um, just finishing my, um, my PhD. Um, he came on sabbatical with his wife and um, son and daughter uh, for six months and, you know, everybody hit it off. And when he was leaving, he said, I'm, I'm applying for, for grants, for USDA grants. If I get any, I'll give you a call. And it took two years before he called, but he did call. And um, so I basically came to, to Penn to do my postdoc. And um, it, was, it was an interesting switch. You know, I was working in human medicine. I was basically, you know, dis disease detectiving um, salmonella outbreaks um, in Scotland. I was a little, little mini CDC. And um, so the animal side of things interested me greatly. Um, and it still does. Most of my research has been um, zoonotic diseases. I study antimicrobial resistance. I've been uh, working with, you know, drug resistant salmonella for many years, E. coli, um, got involved with uh, MRSA back in the early 2000s with my colleagues here. And um, so, you know, that the whole interface between animals and humans is something that I've really been doing now for 30 years if I include my time in Scotland. So um, this, uh, this whole pandemic um, ha has, has, has been very interesting to me just watching how it unfolds. Um, and so let me just switch to my next slide. Um, you can't really see the title up here, maybe you can, it's, it's kind of hidden under my you're sharing your screen icon, but it basically says can my pet get COVID-19? And um, 
as you saw in the previous slide, you know, we're one of the busiest companion animal um, hospitals in uh, the United States, vet teaching hospitals that is, and we have about, you know, 35 uh, patient visits a year. And so as things started to, um, you know, kind of close down, um, this, this question was at the, the front of everybody's minds. And, and, and again, so the reason I'm in my office is I basically never left it. Um, we are essential personnel here. Uh, we run diagnostic labs. And we actually got a little bit busier like during the pandemic rather than quieter because um, in March, April, when everything was pretty much shut down, it was much easier for veterinarians in our local area to get specimens from client-owned animals to us here at Penn Vet than it was to have them picked up or shipped to one of the other uh, commercial diagnostic labs. And so, um, yeah, we're a busy bunch. We've been here um, basically in small teams or shifts um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And almost every single person I have encountered here um, and, you know, friends, family, uh, you know, back at the beginning of the pandemic, they asked, you know, can my cat get it? Can my dog get it? How do we know? And um, so I, I, you know, I kind of made a, a, a decision. I think I talked to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Stephen Cole, who trained with me here at Penn Vet and who actually just started his faculty position in February. Um, and I was kind of like, so you get the lab. Um, for the next few months and I'm gonna go you know dig in like to some of the coronavirus stuff didn't really work out that way because it turns out that when the schools closed Stephen is an excellent teacher and so he basically picked up a lot of the teaching stuff and um, that gave me a little bit more time in the lab which I'm actually thankful for the um, the human animal bond is um, is, is undeniable uh, I think we all know that um, those of us who do have pets, whether we admit to it or not, would um, probably classify or contact with them as close contact. And we do this type of thing um, on the slide every day. You know, we pick them up, we cuddle them, we pet them, they, they lick our faces. I tried not to have any of those pictures on here because it drives me crazy. But, but that is indeed the, the type of contact that we have with our pets. And so... You know, at the front end of a pandemic that was, um, you know, caused by a virus that was spreading very, very quickly from human to human, but that has animal origins, the question had to be, will they get infected? Um, can they give it to each other? Can they give it back to us? Um, or not? Which animals are actually susceptible? Dogs, cats, birds? Um, livestock production animals and we had no answers to any of these questions and as as far into this pandemic as we are now there are still so many questions that are unanswered um, there are many things that we have answers to but we don't have the complete picture just yet and so when I was asked um, to present to you today I thought I would um, approach this from the perspective of, you know, kind of, well, what do we know? And um, how did we get to that place? Uh, what else do we need to be thinking about as we move forward? And I thought a good place to start that was this whole, you know, black swans and pussycats. And so, you know, what do black swans have to do with anything? Um, and this is, this is a, an interesting concept. I'm sure many of you have heard of this, but um, until 1697, nobody in the world had seen a black swan ever. And so the conclusion that was drawn from that was that swans are white. And then Dutch explorers went to Western Australia in um, you know, the late 1600s and observed some black swans and now we know that there are black swans and it's a wonderful thing. What that actually means though is, you know, as a, as a concept, um, and again, you know, there are lots of um, scientists I'm hoping like on the call, but just to, to set up the idea, 
um, of opening your mind to the possibility that something that is perceived to be impossible can someday be proved wrong. Okay, so that's my scene setting. If you want to know more about black swans, I would um, recommend that you um, that you read this New York Times bestseller by uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Um, he is actually a financial guy, and this was uh, the second book he wrote. Uh, came out in two thousand seven. Um, the first book he wrote was called Fooled by Randomness. And um, he talks a lot in there about probabilities and statistics and, and what all of that meant from a, you know, a market analyst per, per, perception. But he introduced the black swan concept in the first book, uh, filled by randomness, and, and, and had so many questions around this notion uh, that he decided to, to write another book. Um, so it's the black swan, the impact of the highly improbable. So the black swan theory or a black swan event is a metaphor that describes an event that comes as a surprise. It has a major effect and is often inappropriately rationalized after the fact with the benefit of hindsight. All of which should be ringing true um, to everyone out there right now. Um, black swan events have some uh, attributes though and so uh, first of all it's an outlier it's an event that lies outside the realm of regular expectations because nothing that we have observed in the past can convincingly point to its possibility and so that's basically a very low probability event um, secondly though uh, it carries an extreme impact and um, in the, the, the books that uh, uh, Taylor brought, he gives like some very good examples of black swan events. Um, and, and they range really, you know, everything. 9-11 uh, was a black swan event. We could not have predicted it, um, but the impact was very extreme. And there are many others, financial crashes, which again is his field. Um, and so people started to ask the question is, you know, is this pandemic a black swan event? It seems to meet these three criteria. You know, nothing in the past can convincingly point to the possibility um, of a, this particular virus. Um, it's certainly carrying an extreme impact. Um, and then the third aspect or third attribute is that in spite of the outlier status, Human nature will make us concoct explanations for its occurrence after the fact, making it explainable and predictable. So, spoiler alert, I apologize. The pandemic isn't a black swan event, and I know that you all know that. Um, it is a portent of a more fragile global system, according to uh, Nicholas uh, 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 Taleb. This was a, a quote from an a, sorry, a, a publication, I think it was a New York Times um, interview that he did back in 2020 because, you know, a whole bunch of people were, were talking about the pandemic as a, as a black swan event. And it's really not, I mean, it was entirely predictable. Um, I could talk about that for hours, but I'm gonna skip to something a little bit different um, but just keeping in mind that, you know, that I've introduced this concept of highly improbable things, um, what does it all have to do with these guys, right? So now we know what a black swan is, what does that have to do with pussycats? And um, the original SARS outbreak, so SARS-1, COVID-1, um, was in 2003. And at that time, there were a handful of reports of infection in companion animals. Um, there's not really very much documented, like truly documented in the scientific literature. There are some wonderful um, comparative, uh, like, you know, looking at different animal models of infection for the original SARS virus. And um, there's a, a description of an outbreak that occurred in the Amoy Gardens complex in Hong Kong that, ha that is pretty well recognized if, um, 
if, if anybody's uh, interested in taking this further. So again, like when all of this started, um, there's lots of, you know, people like me who are, we're clinical microbiologists. It's our job to make diagnoses. And um, so we, we were kind of like, okay, so we may have missed the boat the last time in terms of the science that's available. And so let's get together as a group and, you know, make sure that we, we really, you know, we have something in place. Um, once our colleagues who are doing the translational research, if you will, actually have something to, 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 to give us. And so there's a group um, called the American Association of Vet Lab Diagnosticians. And so basically every state has a state vet lab. Um, there are vet teaching hospitals in um, 30 hospitals, uh, sorry, 30 vet schools now. Um, there's lots of commercial veterinary diagnostic labs. There's two big ones, IDEX and Antec. And um, so like, you know, everybody kind of got together. We're like, oh, say, what, what are we going to do? Like, do we need to start developing tests? Do we, um, you know, do we sit and wait for like the first animal cases like in Hong Kong previously, or do we investigate ahead of time? And so while all of that was going on, um, we were also in a place where it was becoming very apparent that globally, this was exploding. Um, in, in, in humans, it was spreading very rapidly. And I'm sure you all remember back in um, the early part of the outbreak, and in some places, it, you know, that it, it, it extended past the early um, phases of the outbreak, but there was a huge shortage of testing supplies uh, for humans. And so the veterinary community pretty much worldwide um, took a step backwards and said, you know, it's really not appropriate for us to be using these shared resources um, to develop tests for use in companion animals or any animal species when those test supplies are necessary for testing humans. And so everybody in veterinary medicine kind of backed off. And at that time, you know, I heard some people say, well, you know, it's okay to test animals because the tests are different. And they're not different. It's, you know, if we're going to be testing animals, we'll be using real-time PCR tests um, or isothermal amplification tests or, you know, some uh, mixture of, of those. But at the end of the day, the manufacturers of those supplies are pretty much the same. And they certainly were back in, um, you know, the first three months of this outbreak. So that was where we were, and then this happened. Uh, so back in um, early March of 2020, um, the Hong Kong Veterinary Services people reported via the OIE, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them in a moment, um, that they had confirmed infection in a Pomeranian um, from uh, Hong Kong. And so that was really interesting to those of us in this field because the report was actually coming from the same lab that had made the diagnoses in the animals in Hong Kong previously. So, you know, again, a very reputable group of um, researchers and scientists and, you know, government agency people. Um, the one mistake I think they did make, and this is maybe a little bit of opinion, but I have some other you know, colleagues that, that agree is, um, I'm, I'm just about to explain to you the process of how things get reported. Um, and what they did was in, instead of waiting for the official report from the official agency, um, it kind of leaked and ended up in the news. So it was all over the news before there was any science to present to the community. And so that's never a good thing. And so, you know, what should happen is um, that we invoke the World Animal Health Organization. And so 
For many years, the veterinary services group in China have been carrying out surveillance for avian and animal coronaviruses, um, which means that they had the veterinary infrastructure to quarantine and test animals um, that may have for uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus already in place. It was very easy for them to, um, you know, very rapidly uh, validate the tests that they were developing for human use for testing animals. And so the samples from um, the Pomeranian were actually from the end of February. Um, the results were reported to this Animal World Health Organization. Um, and then samples were sent. And then OIE basically confirms and then publishes that information on their website. Um, but again, you know, like in the meantime, there had been a little leak um, to 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 the to the news media. Um, it it was it was kind of you know I don't know it's good it's bad it's there's no news is the news right um, but there is a process in place and so I wanted to um, you know I'm sure there's some some you know pre vet people in this group I hope so and. Um, so just to, to give you a little bit of information about what the OIE is and what it does. Um, so it is the Office International de Epizioti. Uh, that is your French lesson for the day. No need to pay Babel, 6.95 a month. Um, and they have been protecting animals and preserving our future for many years. Um, they were formed um, in uh, 1924. And in May 2003, the office became known as the World Organization for Animal Health, but it kept the historical acronym. And um, there's actually a video embedded in here that I'm not going to show, but um, if, if we share the slides or whatever, then, you know, maybe uh, the, the hyperlink will come up and you can, you can see their little promotional video. So what do they do? Um, so this is uh, data from 2019, and um, it's a little busy, but you know, in 2019, there were 182 member countries and 75 partner organizations. Um, that worldwide uh, um, animal health group um, created these reference centers of expertise, which the Hong Kong lab is a, a WHO, OIE, um, uh, Center of Expertise for Coronavirus Research. Um, they develop national standards and international standards for how things um, should be done, like how I do my job, how we test things, how we report things. Um, they train people. Uh, they train veterinarians. They train people to work in the field. They train epidemiologists. They train uh, uh, many, many different types of people. And, um, and they also do um, uh, missions, scientific missions, when there are outbreaks. So they were, you know, probably um, in, in, invoked in this, like, you know, very early on for preparedness reasons. Um, and then when these first reports started to come in, um, they were in a position to, to basically jump. Uh, this is a very busy slide, um, and um, it was just really to, to show you that they do uh, strategic planning, and um, the strategic plan um, that was in place when this uh, you know outbreak first started um, was 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 giving um, support and strengthening veterinary services at the front lines of public health, and so. It's important that between 2016 and 2020, this was something that the OIE was already working on. It's not something that just happened because, you know, we're in response mode. Um, this was actually, uh, you know, part of their strategic plan and had been, um, you know, ongoing for at least four years. Uh, One Health is, uh, I guarantee you, you know, six months ago, most of our friends and family had no idea what One Health was. And uh, now I'm sure if you ask them, many of them have some concept of what it actually means that, um, you know, in, outbreaks can, can occur that uh, affect the health of humans that came from an animal reservoir. Maybe there's an environmental component. How does everything, um, you know, go from here to there? They've probably seen the news reports that, 
you know, people are screening um, fecal waste and, and they're like, why, why are they looking in the environment? That's not how we get it. And it's like, yeah, no, but if it's there, then we know how it got there. And it's just this incredible, um, you, you know, it, it, it's, I've been a huge proponent of One Health for many, many years. I think it is absolutely the future of how science in this type of area, the area that I've spent, you know, the majority of my career on, um, this is how it should work. And um, if, you know, it, it, it's, I, I just think it's incredible that we're actually all coming together as a scientific community and trying like to figure out how to make these partnerships work while this pandemic is, is, is ongoing. Um, there's also very clearly here um, a huge focus from OIE on uh, zoonotic disease transmission. But the one thing that um, I, I do have to uh, stress here is most of the animal species that OIE are interested in are either livestock or wildlife. Um, they know that, <laughs> we know that in the veterinary community, um, and there's a reason for it. And it's, it's maybe not what you're thinking. The reason for it is animal welfare. Animal welfare is at the heart of everything the World Animal Health Organization does. Um, they, again, I told you they have standards. So they, they, they've, they've put standards together for how animals are transported, how they're used in research, how animals are um, housed and cared for in production systems, how they're slaughtered for human consumption. Um, there's, um, a lot of work on stray dog population control because of rabies, which is another um, zoonotic disease. And um, they're also very concerned about horses who work. Um, there's standards for farmed fish, again, for transport, for slaughter. There's recommendations, guidelines for disaster management and risk reduction, which is unfortunately a teeny tiny box down there on the left. Um, I'm sure everybody's wishing that they had maybe spent more time on on that part, but they did have policies and protocols and procedures in place. Um, I, I, and again, I mentioned OIE's role in this because, um, you, you know, I think for, for our community, for anybody interested in veterinary medicine, um, all we see and hear is the human part of this outbreak. Everybody talks about CDC. Um, very few people are, are, are talking about you know, what the OIE does. And they're probably not even realizing why an organization like this is important. When the um, first report of coronavirus infection in an animal came to OIE, they basically um, designated it as an emerging disease. And so that means that this is a new occurrence in an animal of a disease, infection or infestation, causing a significant impact on animal or public health. Um, in this particular situation, this was an emerging disease label from OIE for animals because this new infection, this new virus was causing um, a, a big impact on public health. But the reason they gave it an emerging disease designation is because OIE are an official regulatory agency. And so that means there's a whole bunch of things that they can do. And um, one of those things is make it a reportable disease, which means if rogue microbiologists like me decide that they want to go look for it in dogs and cats, if I find it, I have to tell them. And I don't get to tell them in a news, uh, like or a press release or a, you know a news conference um, there's a process here and you know every vet diagnostic lab in the world knows what the process is and the process is in place for a very good reason again OIE is primarily concerned with diseases of livestock and we have no idea how a virus like this will affect livestock we have no idea if it has the capacity to infect birds 
or uh, pigs or dairy cattle. And again, this is on the front end of the outbreak. So I'm back in February here. So give me some latitude because what's happened over the last few months is many of those animal experimentation studies have been done. And so we do know that there are some animal species that may be at more risk than others. And thankfully, um, the, the avian production species uh, are, you know, this virus does not infect um, our poultry well. Um, but it, you know, those, those early studies also showed us that it, it can infect um, a variety of other species. So this is, this is the, you know, animal CDC's way of making sure that everything gets reported. We don't have the same kind of money that they do um, on the human side, and so there's no fancy Johns Hopkins map for us. Um, what we have instead is the OIE. So anybody who's looking for this virus in animals at any stage over the last few months, if it was found, it has to be reported to them. Um, back in March, they basically told us uh, in a Q&A that the current spread of COVID-19 is a result of human to human transmission and to date, there is no evidence that companion animals can spread the disease. Therefore, there is no justification in taking measures against companion animals, which may compromise their welfare. Again, remembering that animal welfare is at the heart of their mission. So this is early March. This is basically a Q&A following the report from the Pomeranian in Hong Kong. And then on March 28th, there was a report um, to OIE that a cat in Belgium was positive. Um, on April 17th, a tiger at the Bronx Zoo was found to be positive. And a week or so later, um, one of the lions at the Bronx Zoo was also shown to be positive for this virus. April 22nd, there were two cats in New York, um, one of which was an outdoor cat that apparently had no known risk factors, no association with any positive humans, um, and the other one did. And so the, the kind of risk factor for the acquisition of this virus by animals was starting to define itself because the, the cat from Belgium um, had a, a coronavirus positive owner the lions and the tigers at the New York Zoo um, had come into contact with a, a caretaker, a, a veterinary caretaker who, who was positive. And one of the cats from New York was also um, owned by a, a human who had had coronavirus infection. So the risk factors for acquisition are, you know, kind of starting to emerge, if you will. And so I'll cut to the chase. This is a timeline. And I actually stopped tracking in this form in the middle of July um, because it was just getting very busy, okay, as you can see. So we went from a dog in Hong Kong on February 26 to the cat in Belgium, a couple of cats in um, the tiger, the lion, two cats in the USA. Um, the mink farms in the Netherlands, I'll come back to. So cats in Germany, cat in Russia, cat in Spain, cat in the United States, cat in Illinois. Uh, dog in New York City, dog in Georgia. So no longer just cats. So we started with a dog. We have a whole bunch of cats in the middle. And then we have some dogs and cats and interspersed in there some other animal species. So the mink farms in particular were very, very interesting. Um, and they were very interesting for a couple of different reasons. Um, the mink farms in the Netherlands, uh, there were two reported back in April. Um, and then from April through the end of July, uh, there were mink in Denmark and Spain. By the end of July, the European um, countries that, that had mink farms had slaughtered about 1.5 million mink, um, which is a huge number. And, you know, this virus was actually, you know, spreading from mink to mink. Uh, the initial study that was done by the team from the Netherlands back in April showed that the viruses in the mink 
were very similar to uh, viruses from some humans who worked at the mink farm. And so again, that risk factor of positive humans infecting animals was, you know, at, at the heart of that. The Dutch health minister uh, did a wonderful thing. Um, and she, you know, she kind of stood up to OIE and the CDC and many other people and said, so thank you very much for the information that the risk factor for these animals is being in contact with positive humans. But we believe that there's the possibility for these mink who were shedding very high numbers of virus to reinfect humans. And the entire, you know, animal health world basically stopped in their tracks. We're like, what did she just do? Um, because a lot of the things she was saying, we were already thinking. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to identify a risk factor using uh, you know, a very robust epidemiology study. It's something very different to be told what the risk factor is in the absence of the science. And so, yes, it makes perfect sense that cats and dogs are becoming infected from their owners, especially when their owners are positive. But if you're only looking at a very small number of animals that were tested for some reason, then is there any possibility that you're missing something that's part of this transmission cycle? Um, and so the Dutch health minister basically said, we are going to look. We are going to look at the humans who work on the mink farms. We're going to look at their companion animals. We're, we're going we're gonna to look. And, and so that was, that was almost like the uh, switch uh, being flipped for everybody else and we were like well if they're looking we should look too right and um, but we're still in the middle of a pandemic it's April May the supplies we saw the news reports in the United States the supply chain was awful we just we couldn't get tests and then <laughs> this happened um, so they're doing lots of research in the Netherlands and they actually showed for the first time the infected mink were, who had become infected from the humans were passing it back to humans. Um, and so that was, a, that was a little change in the game, if you will. You know, that, that black swan event, the highly improbable event was now in, in front of our faces. Um, and and then people were like, well, yeah, but it's the mink and they are housed in, um, you know, a production type situation. It's not the same as your dog or your cat. And we're like, how do you know? How do we know? And we don't know. And that's the thing. It's like, we just don't know. So we've, you know, we were staring the Black Swan event in the face. We had some evidence, essentially, that, um, you know, this was, was a possibility. It, it was all happening in Europe. The veterinary scientific community across the world are like, well, should we start studying things now? And, um, and so something changed. And we started to see reports from, from, you know, vet schools in the United States that they were offering testing. We started to see reports from our colleagues across the, the, the globe, basically, um, the University of Glasgow, which has a very large virology unit, um, actually published something in the veterinary record. Uh, they sent a letter to the editor asking veterinarians in the United Kingdom to collect samples from animals and send them to them for testing. And so the shift happened. The, you know, the highly improbable became possible or probable, but we're still on the front ends of the study. Um, in August uh, of this year, uh, two mink farms in the, the United States were shown um, to have positive mink. And uh, again, no big surprise, we've been following this situation at this point in, um, in Europe since, since April. There's not too many mink farms in the United States, but it's very surprising to, to most people, I think, that we actually do farm mink at all. There's maybe like, you know, I think about 275 facilities 
Um, but in 23 states, um, Wisconsin is number one and Utah is number two. And so the, the people that are involved in this, again, this is not my part of this, this story, are really very, very interested in this. I mean, you know, it's the, it, if it can go from human to animal and then back to human on a mink farm in the Netherlands, it can surely do it in the United States. And so these are the places where, as you know, we think we're coming out of the first part of this pandemic, although some people would argue that that is the case. Um, and, and, you know, we're heading into fall and winter where it could be just the same as it was this past winter, or it could be much worse, we don't know. But now we're actually asking questions like, well, where are the reservoirs? It's no longer just people or is it? And again, we don't know. We really don't know. Um, and it's terrifying to, to, to think that we had a very um, obvious chain of transmission from human to human. And now there may be other domestic mammals or otherwise that are capable of being reservoirs and potentially transferring this virus um, back to, to, to humans. Um, so, you know, a lot of research uh, that, that still needs to be done. And so, you know, the, the, the big question on the table, I think, is still, can animals be infected with SARS-CoV-2? And I italicize infected because, um, you know, I've, I've talked to a bunch of reporters and, and news journalists and science journalists over the last few months. And, you know, there is a very big difference between an infection and a transmission event. Infection is a process. It means you go from you know, one virus to 10 million viruses. They amplify, they actually infect. Um, transmission happens every day. We transmit things every time we touch something, every time we touch each other. Um, there are transmission events that have happened, I think, with companion animals that we don't know anything about. There are animals, none of the companion animals that have been reported have really been sick um, and they've always had a you know positive human like in the mix somewhere so you know there's a lot that we, we still don't know um, this this was actually some quotations from uh, OIE on at the end of May um, now that SARS-CoV-2 infections are widely distributed in the human population there is a possibility for certain animal species to become infected Based on the limited data available, the risk of animals spreading the virus to people is considered to be very low. That is the considered opinion of the scientific community. There is absolutely no science to back that up. And I know that we're only, you know, nine months in to a, a, a pandemic, but there's, there's no science currently to back that up. And so maybe it depends where you look. I've used this slide for a million presentations, it seems, over the last um, like six months. When we attribute risk, even when it's the most obvious attribute, living with a positive human means that your animal may become infected. We're looking at the tip of the iceberg. Um, we're not looking at everything else. We are not looking at every single human animal contact. And I think what we're seeing when we only look in animals who may have some clinical signs of respiratory tract infection, they come to the veterinarian, the veterinarian collects specimens, they come to me. If I'm only allowed to look for coronavirus in those animals that live with a positive human or a human who has been positive at some point, I'm looking at the tip of that iceberg. I'm not looking at everything underneath. And I'm much more interested in the population. Um, for the last four or five of the, the past six, uh, sorry, uh, seven months, Philadelphia and New York have been in the epicenter of this uh, pandemic in the United States. And it is almost impossible to get authorization from our state animal health officials to test anything below the surface. Um, 
but we did get some funding here at Penn Bay and we're embarking on a community prevalence study. And the reason we're doing that is because of this. Um, there was a study, it's on the bio archive, so it's not peer reviewed. It was from Patterson um, et al. And it was a community prevalence study um, that was conducted in Italy at the height of their outbreak. It's not a great study in how it's written, um, which is why peer review is, is very important because generally when something gets peer reviewed, like what you put in comes out in much better shape. Um, the study is underpowered overall. So if you have a disease that has a very low prevalence, then even although they sampled 900 dogs and 500 cats, um, if the prevalence is less than 1%, then those numbers are underpowered. And you don't get to add the dogs to the cats because those are two different things and we interact with them in very different ways. So each of these things has to be its own epidemiological unit. Um, they collected a bunch of different swabs. Um, they only collected something like 820 swabs from these 1400 animals. So again, everything is underpowered. Um, they collected um, serum from 188 dogs and 63 cats. None of the animals they tested were PCR positive. However, 3.4% of the dogs, again, there was only 188 of them, and 3.9% of the cats, only 63 cats, but 3.9% of those cats had measurable SARS coronavirus 2 neutralizing antibody titers. Dogs from COVID-19 positive households were significantly more likely to test positive than those from negative households. Again, there's a risk factor here that is maybe the biggest risk factor, but is it the only risk factor? And we don't know the answer. When I saw those figures of 4%, this was exactly what I did. 4% people, that is huge. That is absolutely huge. There's 75 million pet owners in the country. If 4% of those animals are, have zero converted, then these transmission events are actually happening at a much higher rate than we know. And we don't know anything about what those animals are, um, you know, how, how sick they are, if you will. Um, you may remember Winston the pug. Um, he was the first dog to test positive in the United States. Um, on April 28th and then on May 28th, USDA, which is like OIE here, um, could not confirm those preliminary observations. And so Winston went to the COVID-19 fake news basket. Um, Buddy, on the other hand, um, was, who was the first dog in the United States to be positive, um, actually uh, succumbed to an illness um, that may or may not have been related to his positive coronavirus um, status. Um, in July of this year. And um, Natasha Daly from National Geographic did this really wonderful piece of, you know, investigative journalism to highlight the flaws and the gaps in the system that exist. Um, we, we have this incredibly robust system, but it's nothing compared to um, anything that we're seeing in human medicine. Again, we have no Johns Hopkins map. We only have the reports from OIE when these animals are found to be positive, but we don't know if there are a whole bunch of rogue researchers, and I promise I'm not one of them, <laughs> um, who are testing like a bunch of animals and not telling OIE because they want the paper first. So um, it's, it's, it's a little murky right now and it does have to be fixed. And I'll kind of leave you with this. Um, I, I, I talked to um, Natasha for this story, um, and this was the quote that she pulled. If we are telling the world that the prevalence of animal cases is, is low, then we have to look at very high numbers. We have to look under the iceberg. We can't keep looking where we think the risk is. Um, I do have one more slide. Um, since this first started, we have been on this, no evidence of transmission from humans to animals, no evidence of transmission from animals to humans. Every major um, agency, the, the AVMA, uh, OIE, CDC, WHO, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, and pretty much everybody else is still telling us there's no evidence when the evidence is staring us right in the face. 
And so we can move the line. We're all behind the line and we can move the line. And I think it's time that we, we move the line. Um, can your pet be tested? Not at this time. It's still an OIE emerging disease. Um, the decision to test any animal is still in the United States made collaboratively between the attending veterinarian and state or federal animal health officials. And so there will be no um, SARS-CoV testing for, for all of our pets anytime soon. Um, but it may come um, and it will come as the evidence begins to accumulate. And so um, I also put this on here. I regularly update a Google document, um, mostly with science and resources, occasionally articles from uh, reputable media outlets and rarely with news. Um, because in the absence of science, it's just nonsense. And um, that's me, I'm done, thank you. I hope there are questions. I may have talked a little more than I intended, but we still have time um, for questions. And this is Jack, so. So Dr. Rankin, we do have a couple of questions down in the Q&A and for anyone who would like to ask uh, questions, please do write it into the Q&A. Uh, I don't know if you can read that Dr. Rankin yes, or would so you like- Absolutely, yes. So uh, Madison, Pravacek, I hope I got that right with my Scottish accent, asked uh, what compels or enforces the reporting of an emerging disease in animals to the OIE? Must you be a member or is it anyone from a country that is a member to that organization? And so it's actually the second part of that. So um, if you recall, I mentioned that there are 182 member countries and so the process in veterinary medicine works like this. So I test Fluffy, Fluffy's positive. I call the USDA, National Veterinary Services Laboratory, and my state animal health officials. And then we coordinate to send the specimens that were presumptively positive in my lab to NVSL if they're positive at NVSL, then the head of the United States Department of Agriculture actually makes the report to OIE. So it's this very convoluted regulatory system. But we do it every single day in veterinary medicine. Um, my lab at New Bolton Center uh, tested, you know, 500 samples a day for avian influenza. If any of those are positive, they're presumptively positive, and then they go to um, NVSL and if they're confirmed then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens at the Department of Agriculture level and um, and so this is this is something that we're very used to doing in um, in vet medicine. Uh, the next question is do you think the animals come into a higher risk from COVID-19 through airborne contamination or through contact with all the animals whether it be directly touching and so um, so again, contact is, is, is interesting. Um, it is a respiratory virus. We know that it's airborne. Um, there's still some controversy over whether it's, it's um, you know, aerosolization or just droplets. Um, the animals, again, if we're going with the risk factor model, then there are humans who are positive that can be transmitting the virus to animals. As for animals transmitting to animals, the only evidence we have currently are the mink, okay? And there's clearly evidence of sharing. Um, but I don't know, we're still very early in the, um, in the process. Uh, Sarah Doddick asks, I frequently drive past a vet office that has a sign in the window <laughs> stating that they do COVID-19 testing on your pets. Is it a scam? Um, no, um, I don't know that I'd pay for the test though. Um, there, there's, there are no validated tests for companion animals, absolutely none. All of the tests that are available for humans are also currently unvalidated. They have a federal emergency use authorization, which means um, some preliminary science has been done to show that they can detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus and that they do not cross-react with any other um, uh, coronaviruses. That's kind of pretty much it. Or they don't cross-react with any flu viruses and, and that kind of stuff. Um, there's no validated testing for companion animals. The labs that are doing it for research um, or in collaboration with state animal health official requests are essentially using 
um, FDA approved tests. So I, my email address is on the, uh, <laughs> the first slide, feel free like to send me some information on that. Uh, Toriana Labar, since it is not approved to test animals, can you be penalized for actually testing an animal after you report it? So yeah, you can be penalized. Ignorance is no defense here. Um, and you don't get to report it directly to the OIE. It has to go through that process of vet diagnostic lab to USDA to OIE. Um, is the recommendation that if you have any respiratory illness to stay away from your pet, not for the worry of transmission only, but transmission and mutation to a new strain. Um, the recommendations have been reasonably clear and I think throughout from our CDC that if you have any respiratory infection, but particularly in the middle of the pandemic, especially if you're coronavirus positive, then you should be minimizing contact with um, other humans and also your pets. Um, Jordan, has the source of COVID-19 been determined yet or is it generally agreed that it originated in bats and other wildlife? So I checked on this um, just last week and there's still some, you know, bat, batting around, if you will. Uh, we know it is a bat virus that has been determined, but we don't know how um, it got to the market in Wuhan or which animal species was responsible for transmitting it to humans. Um, pangolins are still high on everybody's list, but I don't know that anybody has absolutely confirmed that yet. Let's see, Danielle Minion. Once an animal is confirmed positive, what happens next for that animal and their owners? Actually, you would be surprised at very little. Um, the, if an animal is confirmed as positive, um, in the United States, there's no quarantine. Um, if the animal is in a, in a hospital, then um, there are very few, if any, precautions um, that, are, that are taken. It, it's really truly not believed at this point that it can transmit from companion animals to, um, to, to humans. Okay? And again, we don't know. Um, so yeah, it's basically the animal can go home and, and just be, you know, minimize contact. Uh, Sam Adams. Oh, a beer sounds good. What can we do to help educate <laughs> others that haven't gotten this scientific evidence? Um, is there any way we can, as a community, push the AVMA or OIE to test animals and stop saying that there isn't any evidence? So I don't know who you are, Sam, but you and I are breathing the same air. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm at a point in my career where, if, you know, unless I break a law, um, I can invoke the academic freedom card at any point. <laughs> And, and that's essentially what I did. I was like, you know, you don't have to like the fact that I am testing companion animals that come through my hospital, but I'm going to do it anyway. So uh, I did actually get permission from our leadership because, um, you know, we don't want to go completely rogue. But uh, I think the only way to push any of this from highly improbable to possible is by doing that research. So that's, they're all great questions. Um, Caitlin McDonald, how frequently do we see diseases spreading from humans to animals and back to humans? Humans to animals and back to humans. Um, so the ones I've studied in the past have been things like MRSA, um, the regular, um, you know, zoonotic diseases. So things like salmonella that we expect to come, you know, from animals to humans, but can occasionally make a human sick via the uh, food chain and then can be transmitted back to, to animals. It's, it's not very frequent, um, but it can happen and it is documented. Uh, Cynthia Keller, has there been any documented case, cases in large domestic animals such as pigs, sheep or cows? Nothing documented, but experimental transmission has been shown. Um, so uh, Kansas State University has a large animal um, uh, BSL-4 facility that they can do these types of experiments and, and, and they have shown that um, you can infect 
large animals, but we don't know whether they would produce enough viruses to be expelled to be infectious um, to, other, uh, to other animals. Uh, Alvia Wilson, how is the science community allowed to state that the risk of animals spreading COVID to humans is low without any testing back up to prove this? Um, that's a question I ask myself every day. <laughs> And um, and I was I was joking uh, when we were we were setting this up that you know sometimes the voices that are heard are just the loudest voices, and um, and I've I've been a huge thorn in the side of many of these agencies over the last six months, including like within AAVOD and um, and CDC. It's like you just don't get to say this stuff, and and so one of the things that I I put on the slide was the um, you know, it's it's not probable, and therefore everybody should not consider abandoning their animals. And um, so that was that was a very common theme that you know we can't look in animals because if we find it, people will abandon their animals, and that is one outcome. Absolutely agreed that that is one possible outcome, but if the information is coming from you know a reputable scientific source rather than the news then you get to control the narrative a little bit better and so that was my argument within my community for you know let's come together and decide how we are going to do this as a community so that when the information gets out there it is um it's good solid information and honestly if all the animals are negative that's awesome but you don't get to say it if you're not testing. Um, would our pets show different symptoms than humans if they have COVID? Yes, that would seem to be the case. Um, many of these animals were tested because they lived with positive humans and they were asymptomatic. Um, they didn't have very high viral loads, but they were, they were positive. The animals who did have symptoms um, did have respiratory symptoms. Um, but they don't cough generally. Um, we, we can't ask them, have you lost your sense of taste or smell? Um, and so there are, there are some parts that we're, we're not very sure, but the respiratory symptoms are, uh, they seem to be much milder, which also goes to those questions of infectivity. Um, you know, how infectious is it? Is it actually making animals sick or is it just being transmit? Is it transmitting, amplifying a little bit? and then um, the immune system takes care of it. So are these companion animals dead end hosts? That's a big question on everybody's mind. Um, one of my colleagues from uh, Colorado State, uh, their group just published um, to show that it's very transmissible in deer mice in a lab situation. And that has huge implications for wildlife in, um, you know, in the United States. And so we don't know. Uh, when a vaccine comes out and more testing becomes available to animals, would a specific vaccine be made for animals or would the same vaccine be used? It would probably be animal specific. Um, this was a, a question, Melanie, that initially people were saying that, you know, you could use the dog corona vaccine like to vaccinate humans. Um, and you can't. You just, A, those are different viruses, but um, they tend to be very species specific. Uh, Toriana, what large animals can be infected? Um, there is a really good um, article that has been published recently in PNAS. Um, and they did, it was a modeling study based on um, ACE2 um, receptors. And they basically highlight the animals that can be, you know, most likely to be infected from like top to bottom. Um, all of the non-human primates, of course, are in there. Um, cows were pretty susceptible. Horses were pretty susceptible. Um, pigs, maybe. Um, we haven't actually seen any evidence um, in the, the, the swine industry. So um, I don't know. But and again, it's it, at this particular point in time, I think we have to take those modeling studies that are showing us which animals may be infected and then just go look. I, I, we have to start looking. 
Um, is there any testing to create a COVID-19 vaccine using antibody trials on animals? Do you feel the results could accurately represent the antibody responses in humans if the likelihood of animals being affected is supposedly so improbable? Um, I am not aware um, of vaccine antibody trials for animals. There may be trials using potential vaccine candidates that would be ultimately used on humans that are being tested on, um, on animals. Uh, probably not mice and rats because they're not very susceptible. Um, I believe there's some work going on with ferrets um, and maybe those deer mice. They seem to be um, like, a, like a, a pretty good model um it's just it's it's wonderful like to be you know on the front end of something i hope there are you know some of you out there that are following this um as, as you embark on on your scientific career this is you know it's a tremendous um burden it's also a tremendous scientific opportunity if you ask the right questions and um and particularly from a One Health perspective, um, we at, at New Bolton Centre, my colleagues, um, in collaboration with uh, Pennsylvania Wildlife Fishing Game, I always get their name wrong, um, have just embarked on a Wildlife Futures Programme. Um, it's a $10 million grant over five years. Um, that was all actually signed off on probably this time last year before the pandemic um, began. And it's, it's not really designed to be looking for, you know, SARS coronavirus in, in wildlife. It was, it was mostly for um, uh, chronic wasting disease and white nose syndrome and bats and, you know, some of the uh, more common um, wildlife uh, diseases. But I can certainly see a future and some additional funding perhaps for that program to be screening wildlife um, for, for, for this virus. Um, Dr. Lisa Murphy and Iman Anis um, at New Bolton Centre have started a program where they're screening um, the Pennsylvania bat population. Um, apparently, and I had no idea that this happened, there are many people in the state who rehabilitate bats. And so they decided um, like to test bats like before they, they um, you know, they send them back to the wild. So, um, so there's a lot going on, basically. And um, Reg mentioned earlier, again, there may be some of you who are pre-vet that are interested in studying these things. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you should go check out the, um, the Wildlife Futures Program. I think they have a website that probably has some very minimal information on there, but I'm sure there, there's a whole bunch of things that you would all be interested in um, and studying for the future. They're actually on my list for a future One Health seminar, maybe in the spring. Oh, great. That's awesome. Um, there's actually another question that just came up. Has there been any animal testing, mainly on monkeys? Um, so the, because this is essentially like a kind of BSL-3 or higher um, virus, then the, the facilities, the veterinary facilities that are doing um, like animal experiments using, um, you know, non-human non primates or any of those large animals, they're all being done in um, the, the, the schools or, you know, the veterinary uh, facilities that have BSL-3. And um, there's actually way less of those than you would think. Um, so Kansas State, I know, was involved. Um, Minnesota, I think. Colorado. Uh, gosh, I'm tired. There's probably another, you know, half a dozen states that are doing this, this, this type of research. And again, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of research being done across the, the globe. Um, the BioArchive preprint server, like, updates daily. And you have to, you know, you have to take some of what's on there with a, a grain of salt. Um, there's currently about 9,000 non-peer-reviewed publications. Um, and so, uh, yeah, 
the, 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 Google, the Google Doc, I try and capture as many of the animal um, studies as I possibly can and just put the, the link um, to the, the bioarchive link or you know anything else that's been um, published. Uh, okay, there's been a lot of discussion about ferrets. Um, after the reports of several minks infected in the Netherlands, there was a lot of talk formulating about how ferrets, because of their relationship to mink, are one of the largest risks for humans as they are already susceptible to influenza A and B. Is there any substance to these worries? I think so, yes. I do. Um, the, the part of this, though, that we have to... I just want to dissect a little bit is... Um, most people are not coming into contact with wild ferrets and most people who have domestic ferrets in their home, like you would a cat or a dog, um, are, are very finicky owners um, and I'm sure they're aware of the risks. So also these animals don't get out. So their risk is pretty much the same as a dog or a cat. And we talked about that here when we were setting up the community prevalence studies. Should it just be dogs and cats or should we add ferrets? And we did. Um, we haven't had any actually come through the hospital because everybody's operating at maybe 60% capacity right now in veterinary medicine. Um, but I, yeah, I do. I think there is some, some substance to that. Um, Melanie, again, if mice and rats are not very susceptible to the virus, would this extend to most other rodents? or is susceptibility based on other factors? And so initially, I think people thought that, you know, you, when the lack of susceptibility was demonstrated on the lab mice and lab rats, um, we do what we normally do and just assume that, you know, that translates to all of the rodents. Um, but, I, you know, some of our colleagues have challenged that and, and you know, they're doing tests on, um, and I, the reason for the deer mouse, mouse testing was interesting because um, all of the scientific research essentially shut down, um, as you know, and, and so the, uh, the, the places where people buy their lab mice and rats, when research started again, it was very difficult for them like to, you know, maintain, um, you know, their animal uh, numbers. And so they were having like to ramp up their production. And, and so somebody was like, well, you know, there's no mice and rats anyway, uh, but there was some deer mice available. And so they had to do those studies to see if they were actually susceptible. And it turns out they're very susceptible. So, um, yeah. And that's, again, you know, it's, you, we're, we're all mammals, but whether it's a modeling study or, you know, an actual study, and these have been done too, where, you know, people are counting the number of receptors on, uh, you know, upper respiratory tract epithelial cells. Um, and I was really surprised at how much people actually know about like ACE2 receptors in the first place. Um, and so it was, it was easy for some of that research to um, find its way um, to the scientific community pretty quickly. So which animals do we think would be susceptible? Um, and everybody thought cats were going to be more susceptible than dogs, and that might be evening out. Or maybe it's the same. Maybe it's 1%, maybe it's 4%, maybe it's, I don't know, 50. I doubt it. But, um, <laughs> but that number between, you know, because you don't really see a convert unless you have you know, a number of viruses that your body feels it's time like to get an immune response going here, you know, it doesn't happen when there's only 10 viruses hanging around in the back of your throat. So we're, we're being, um, we, we, we just, we can't forget the basics of infectious disease, which is there's usually some type of infectious dose and different hosts have different susceptibilities even if they're part of the same species. So German shepherds might be more susceptible than Labrador retrievers. We don't know. So lots and lots of research still to be done. These are great questions. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, um, to have answered those really good questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rankin. I think this has been a fabulous start to our one Health Seminar series for this fall. 
Uh, I really appreciate all the attendees and you've had some great questions. Yes. And just keep in mind that this uh, will be posted to uh, the DelVal site. So it'll be www.delval.edu okay. forward slash One Health. So uh, if there's something you'd like to review again, uh, you can come back and, and look at it again or tell your friends about it. So yeah. thank you, Dr. Rankin. We appreciate thank it. Much. Thank you, everybody, for hanging Good around. Night. And if you have any questions, send me a message. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was that was that was good. I mean, I probably went over a little bit with the questions, but while they're asking questions, then we should Absol answer them, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Like inquiring minds. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I am looking forward to contacting the wildlife futures folks and uh, and hearing more about that. And uh, yeah, like you were saying, I'm I'm sure that they were starting out thinking about one thing and then oh decided. Gosh, yeah. You know, there's a lot more questions to be answered now. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and I am, um, I was on the admissions committee at Penn for like, I did like two terms basically. And then I was off for like a, a few years. And um, I was talking to Lisa recently and I was like, you know, I remember when I was on admissions and, you know, we had like students coming through that were really interested in wildlife. And I'm like, mm, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot of things really well, but that's not one of them. And so it's great, like, I think to finally be having those connections and, um, yeah. and it opens up like so many new collaborations. That's, that's the thing. You know? I used to, uh, years ago, I worked at the, I was the senior vice president for conservation and science at Philly Zoo. And I used to go to the vet school and, and do a guest lecture every, yeah. every year on conservation issues. So that's uh, awesome. So yeah. Nice to see the wildlife side getting in there it, too. It really is. And, and I, um, I don't remember who it was. I think it was um, when I was an undergrad microbiology, um, like one of our professors said something about, you know, you're, you don't realize it yet, but at some point you have to specialize, right? And so just make sure that the thing that you choose to specialize in makes you happy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and I tell, I tell these guys that all the time, you know, it's like, if, 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 if it doesn't make the hair in the back of your neck stand up, <laughs> and don't do it you don't know do just it. don't do it you have to enjoy it every day and i again i i started on the human side kind of jumped to i came here basically like to work with the poultry industry and chuck benson i don't know if you remember chuck and um and bob Eckrode and stuff for the interrated pilot project had just got funded and um the salmonella reference center was starting and um, and then, you know, we basically came through the Department of Agriculture's, um, well, you know, everybody was, was broke in 2009, right? And 